going to um, do what, what I would call more of an introduction to Ecclesiastes today, and uh, then next time we'll be jumping on into a little more in-depth, the next few weeks, of course, a little more in-depth uh, of the book. Um, I have to say that of the books that we are studying this semester, that Ecclesiastes is, is the most interesting to me. And I'll tell you why it's the most interesting. Um, my hope is that if you, up to this time, have not discovered an Ecclesiastes moment in your life, that you will learn what that is, and as your life goes along, you will discover many of them, in fact. Um, I'll, I'll be defining what I think I mean by that as we go along, but every, every time I come back to teach Ecclesiastes, I have a new Ecclesiastes moment that has, uh, that has impacted my life. Usually it's an experience of some sort. And maybe I'll tell you some of those experiences and you will get an idea of what I mean by that. Um, one year, um, I've almost taught the book about once a year, but one year uh, my father-in-law passed away. Uh, one year, my own father passed away after seven years of Alzheimer's. Um, one year, my daughter got married. Uh, one year, uh, our first grandchild was born, about approximately in the middle of the class. I think you get the idea. They are experiences that, that cause you to think deeper about life than we normally do on a day-by-day -day basis. We kind of drift along and rarely go as deeply as we do when we have some of those very personal experiences. And as we go through our class on Ecclesiastes, as we go through these next few weeks, I'll probably be sharing a few of those with you. But I'm, I'm going to um, claim today that I have had an experience that I know that no one in this room has had. And that is to go back to your 25th year high school reunion. Can I safely say that? Nobody's at that point. Uh, mine actually is quite a few years back, but I, I remember it so well. Uh, and in fact, before I tell you about my, f my friends who I graduated bit, uh, with, uh, I'd, I'd actually like you to imagine a little bit. Fast forward, whenever that will be in your life, when you reach what, early 40s, somewhere in there? Uh, and go back, imagine going back now to talk to people that you graduated from high school with, about age 18 or thereabouts. What's the conversation going to be like? What are people going to be talking about, do you think? And let's set, set the ground rules here that, that the conversations are pretty honest that there's a little bit of posing going on, uh, but mo for the most part, by the time you reach that point, there's some pretty honest conversations that are going on. Uh, what, what might you imagine that your friends at 25 years after high school are gonna be talking about? Okay, Albert. How many kids do they have? talking about families now. Um, most were not married, obviously, at that time, so they got married at some point. Maybe they're going to introduce a husband or a wife, but they're going to definitely, in many cases, be talking about kids. Talking about kids, comparing ages and all that kind of thing. What else do you, do, would you imagine? Frank? Careers, yeah. Maybe the romance in high school. The ro <laughs> my wife, my wife came with me to the 25th reunion. She had, of course, I had not known her until many years after. She wanted to meet my girlfriends. <laughs> that was the most important thing to her in that in that whole experience was meeting my girlfriends. But um, while I'm thinking of that, just a tip. Um, if the event is not requiring spouses, 
you know what, you may not want to bring a husband or a wife because it is very boring for them. <laughs> and what I found out is that that was one of the most interesting evenings that I can remember. It was a dinner and, and uh, on into the evening. And, uh, but my wife was bored to death the whole time. She did not know these people, could care less about all their backgrounds. I was fascinated by it all. But uh, yes, the uh, romances, Boyfriends, girlfriends, where did they all end up? Um, um, and careers. Careers is a really big one. Careers is a really big one. What, 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 other, what other things might you imagine would be the topic of conversation 25 years after? Caitlin, what do you think? I was just going to say people talking about like, what used to be, like how things were okay. in high school. Excellent. Know? Reminiscing. There's been enough years now to truly reminisce about the way things used to be. The good old days. Yeah, and I think you've heard people say, ask the question, were the good old days really as good as we remember them to be? There's a lot of an idealizing, isn't there, about those good old days. Um, Sean, do you think there'll be any negative stuff talked about? At that point, probably. I think uh, mm -hmm. we're actually talking about this the other day, like a 10-year reunion. People are all kind of bragging about where they're at. Yeah. But when you get to 25 years or so, I think people are more honest like, about the mistakes they've made. They think they're really valued. Yeah. That's a, that, that's a great observation, what you think will happen, because that's exactly what I ran into. Uh, there were some who had some of those dreams fulfilled, but I'll tell you, there were a lot of them who didn't. And the conversation with people that you'll probably rarely see again was very honest about some of the disillusionment, things that you thought you were going to accomplish, maybe even back to Franklin's point, maybe a career that you thought you were going to pursue, but it never happened. Um, or it didn't happen in the way that you thought it was going to happen. The discussion is sometimes about which marriage are you on, uh, which is sad to me um, because with a, a few that I remember by early 40s, they were actually on a third marriage at that time. Um, again, some of the disillusionment of relationships that had not been the way that they thought they were going to be. But a huge, a huge thing, I think, a kind of a sub-theme of the whole evening was um, um, the w how things turned out when I didn't think they would ever turn out that way. Surprises, um, some of them disappointments of things that were dreams when we were in high school, and yet they, they ended up not being that way. Well, lest you think that this is so far down the road. Sean, I'm taking it, have you had your 10th reunion? Uh, yeah, it was last year. Okay. Yeah, yeah that, that would be true. I know of a number of you, you're about around in those ages. Um, lest you think that this 25 re year reunion doesn't apply to you, um, let me tell you a new concept that is, there, there are websites about this. Instead of talking about a midlife crisis, which would be what many of my friends were going through in their early 40s, there is now a new term called a quarter-life crisis. And you, I, I was looking it up. Uh, Scott, Scott Ray, uh, I don't know if any of you were here yesterday as he spoke in chapel, but he spoke of, of this. I think it was in the chapel message where he spoke of it. And uh, I, had a, I, had a, I had actually done a little bit of digging around on, on a couple websites and and there's a whole bunch of stuff on the internet about quarter-life crisis. Uh, someone like you, who is somewhere between 20 and early 30s, who has already been disillusioned by things that have happened in life and are already asking questions about where life is going to go. And I found that really interesting because the, ter the term was coined obviously copying midlife crisis, but now many of your friends are going through a quarter life crisis, or at least they perceive that to be it, of dreams and, and things. Well, as you, as you know already about Ecclesiastes, this has everything to do with the book of Ecclesiastes, and trying to figure out 
the interpretation of this book, I think, is related very much to, to the idea of um, shattered dreams, um, things in life that did not turn out the way we thought that they would turn out. Uh, here's a quote from an actor who died several years ago now, Marlon Brando. If you've been in any way a fan of the Godfather series, this is Mr. Godfather. He, he was the star of that. Um, Marlon Brando, I, have, I did not follow him. I did not consider him to be an actor I was really interested. I actually only saw one of the Godfather movies. But I found this quote. Uh, this was within a year after at the, that he was nearing death. He, he had an illness toward the end of his life. And uh, this is what he said about life. I found this to be fascinating. He said, life is a mystery. You can never understand what it is all about. And then when you come to draw your last breath, you look back and you say, what was that all about? I don't know about you, but that really strikes me as sad. That is, that is someone who would pursue, in his case, many dreams that he was able to fulfill, things that he accomplished, uh, an accomplished actor and so forth, and yet at the end of his life, it doesn't seem like he really found anything that he was looking for, the dreams that are in life. So as we, as we come to a study of Ecclesiastes, this is very much the attitude that Kohelet, the uh, wisdom teacher who is, who is conveying this wisdom to us, is, found, uh, is, is re revealing to us in Ecclesiastes. Now, I'd like to hear a little bit from you once again, and that is, um, what, what has been your involvement with this book and response to it? Uh, maybe you've attempted to read it, uh, hopefully at some time maybe even to study some passages from it. I'd like to hear from you, what do you, what do you observe other people say about the book? Because this, this is a book that is not easily sold and conveyed in the church. This is a book that I think really is an important one, especially for our era of American Christianity, but it is one that is not easily understood. It takes some explanation. Um, talk to me. What are some of the things that you have experienced with this book? <laughs> and we'll get to that subject in a moment. You're right, absolutely right. The despair. Yeah. yeah. You and other pastors who were doing the teaching felt like, uh oh, we made a mistake here. Yeah, not even made a mistake, but just like look at the reality of how hard life is. Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> um, yes, so it was I agree. Good, but it wasn't. Yeah, yeah, that, that that's a great observation. I think uh, so. It was a preaching series, yeah. and did you have people involved in discussing it yeah, in small I, groups? Yeah, we would get the small group leaders to see it. And good, to good. Now that would have been interesting to be a little mouse in one of those groups yeah. and listen in on that. Any anyone else? What are other experiences that you have had with? Ecclesiastes, or your observations maybe about how people respond to it. Is it like Caitlin is describing, where there's this intensity about it and you're not quite sure how to resolve things? Or have you found really good things in the book that have been encouraging? Anyone? Anyone else have studied it or used it in a church setting? Read it. <laughs> okay, Zach. You know, I, I think uh, my perception, I've never, I don't think that part of it I would say really speaks to you, I don't think. But, um, you know, I think my perception of the book has kind of changed over the years and I remember reading it when I was like a teenager and, you know, mm -hmm. at the time it actually seemed kind of cool. You know? uh -huh.
<laughs> yeah, yeah. Both, both about life, um, is that all there is, but also questions that some, that some have had about the book itself. Why is it even in the Bible? What, what purpose does this serve, other than maybe to get us thinking about some of these things? But the, the ov overall response of many people who venture into the book without any teaching or explanation of it, is they will come away with a rather empty, negative feeling about, about the book. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about the moods. This is a book where it's very important, I think, to understand moods. Moods that are being portrayed in the book. And, and the reason why the wisdom teacher wants to create a certain mood in the process of of doing the teaching. Uh, I will admit that in my first involvement with the book, which actually was in college, I also was enamored by it, partly because it was such, to me, such a difficult book to make sense of. And um, I, I never have um, tried to do, Caitlin, what you're describing, which is preaching through all, the whole book. I have done selected parts of it. I will say this, I think this, is probably one of the greatest examples of a book that you have to be very careful about your use of passages because everywhere in the book of Ecclesiastes you can pull a passage out of context and, not, and, and, and get a meaning that is really not the intent of, I think, of what the book overall is. Um, the way I like to put it is every passage must be read in its context and the context is the whole book. You can't just grab a paragraph here and there and come up with something like you might be able to out of one of Paul's epistles. You need to understand the message of the whole book. And of course, that's, why, that's what we're trying to do as we do this, this three-week overview, four, three to four-week overview, is understand a bit of what, what was the wisdom writing attempting to do in its setting and for many generations to come. This is a theme I like to use uh, for the book, and I want to I talk a bit now of different approaches that have been taken. It is a book that reflects futility and frustration. It intentionally lays out a search that the wisdom writer and writers, I would say possibly more than one, the wisdom teacher or teachers in the book are attempting to do. It, struggles with the meaning of a relationship with God, but it does not always assume that there's a relationship with God. And this is why I think this book particularly is good for a Christian to understand more deeply because it helps us to interface with an unbelieving world around us. Uh, it helps, if I understand Ecclesiastes, it helps me to go back to my 25th Reunion, regardless whether people are Christians or not Christians, to understand their point of view and why they're, why they're coming up with the views that they are coming up with. Now, let's take a few passages as a sampling. We've already talked about this, but um, could I have uh, David over there? Would you take 1, verses 2 and 3? Sean, take 2, 10 and 11. Uh, Mike, would you take 3, 18 to 21? And I'm going to jump all the way over here. Howard, if you'll take 3, 12 to 14. And then Zach, take 12, 13, and 14. I want to just illustrate by reading some of the passages the real swing of moods that we have in this book. It, it's, it's very interesting to see how you can have so negative and so positive all within the same book. Okay, uh, David, go ahead for the, with the first one, 1, 2, and 3.
We're going to come back to that in a minute, but isn't that a great beginning to a book? <laughs> Everything is meaningless. I mean, if you, do, if you don't understand what you're getting into here, you can be really turned off quickly in this book. And uh, the NIV, of course, has taken the word vanity and, and taken it a step further than most translations have to the word meaningless. All right, uh, Sean, if you go with us on 2, 10, and 11. So there's a great description, someone who's lived life for a while, pursued many things, and what's the conclusion? <laughs> it's all vanity. Um, and then Mike, if you'll read this, uh, 3, 18 to 21. This is one of my favorites, actually. Isn't that a great Darwinistic passage? <laughs> We're no different than the animals. Um, but it does bring out one of the most important themes in the book, and that is physical death. Uh, the, the great equalizer, the great equalizer of all life, especially human life, the great equalizer is that everyone must face death. And that as we'll see in the next week or two, that is a very important and powerful teaching tool in this book. The reality of the fact that we come to the end of our life and we're all going to face physical death. Um, that's what it means in this passage when it says that our destiny is no different than the animals. And here's a great place where we have to put this into context. It's no different than the animals in the category of physical death. But it is not saying anything about an afterlife or spiritual life following that. Uh, this, this is a passage that is focused on the idea of, of spiritual death, of, of physical death, I should say. All right, let's go to a little better news. And uh, Howard, if you read 3, 12 to 14. Great, thank you. Yeah, that's through eight, um, yeah, through f fourteen. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, you see, you see a number of these kind of passages all the way sprinkled through Ecclesiastes. And the weird thing is, they appear right after a very, pe very negative, pessimistic passage. We've got to figure this out. What are the enjoy life passages? What are they about? Uh, they're, they're sometimes overlooked in this book as a very important part of the message. But here we have this note of optimism, I would even say spiritual optimism, because God is brought into the discussion, whereas in other places God doesn't seem to be anywhere. So there are about six or so of these enjoy life passages that have the very similar wording to them. And, and then, Zach, if you'll take us to the end of the book, where we will end up eventually... 12, 13, and 14. Having heard everything, I have reached this conclusion. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will evaluate every deed, working in every secret thing, every word of the A commitment to God at the end of this book to live out a life that is. God-fearing, this is a very much like a description of the man Job. Fear God and keep his commandments. Um, 
this is not the man, does not seem to be the man that we have described throughout the book, but it's some kind of a conclusion. In fact, most would view it as the primary conclusion of the book. And what we have to figure out as we go is, how does the argument of the book bring us to this point? How does this point cap off the whole, the whole book? Uh, now, I, I want to finish with just a, a few thoughts. I may go back and unpack these a little bit. Um, do I have this in your PowerPoint slides? Yeah, I thought I did put this in there. Because of the nature of the book of Ecclesiastes, we've just had a, a good illustration of the swing of moods from what seems to be very pessimistic on the one hand to very spiritual and optimistic on the other hand. There have been various approaches to the book as to how we would explain it. Uh, Kidner, uh, your, your book, uh, textbook, has actually unpacked a couple of these, and I really like what he has said in them. I'll quote just a few statements out of it. But I want to add a couple of others that are not mentioned in here specifically by Kidner that I think are they're reflective of the way people have approached this book. The last one by um, Tremper Longman is a more recent approach to the book, um, so it would not have been held as, as long. Back to number one, um, the frustration with the negativism that many have had has resulted in the view of some that this is a, an example of a worldly man. In the New Testament terms, we would call it a fleshly um, individual walking by the flesh, not by the spirit. He is away, if he is a believer in God, he is away from God for the most part. And what is being reflected in the book throughout is a completely worldly viewpoint. It is intentionally negative, and the reason it's negative is to serve as a lesson to us. Uh, yes, this viewpoint would say we should read the book, but we should read it as something that we should never become. This is a book of someone who is, we, we should never become this kind of a person because of the negativism and the, the worldly perspective that's found on life. Um, Kidner, Numbers 2 and 3, has a couple of really good approaches to the book. And to be honest with you, through the years, as I've wrestled with the book a bit, uh, there have been different times when I've, I've, I've held each of these uh, as far as what the book is about. Uh, number two, and there are they're, I think they're distinct even though they have similarities. Number two is that this is Kohelet. Kohelet is the wisdom speaker or the wisdom writer that is in the book, I think. We'll get to his name in a moment, but the name Kohelet appears throughout the book. And it is, it is the Hebrew name for this book. The book is called Kohelet because of the key character in it. Um, here's, here's what he says, that is, um, Kidner says about about this viewpoint. I'm just going to take a couple quotes. That the book Kohelet is a debate, of, of Kohelet's debate within himself. Um, this book is the broodings and the outbursts of a man of many moods and total honesty, whose, whose faith is hard pressed by the seeming futility of existence. He goes on to say, at intervals, some light breaks through as he commends enjoyment of God's uncomplicated gifts. Yet even this is clouded, however lightly, with reminders that all such joys are fleeting, however beautiful in their time. So one viewpoint is that we have in this book an internal debate of someone within himself. Um, almost like, uh, this is probably a poor analogy, but almost like Paul in Romans chapter 7. The things I know to do, those are the things that I do not do. And the things that I do, not, that I want, that I do those are the things that I should not do. Um, it's this wrestling with himself. A second view that is presented by Kohelet, uh, and I should say by Kidner, is that Kohelet is presenting different views of life in this book, but it's intentional, and 
the presentation of them is trying to make a case about something. It is creative drama. And uh, to be honest with you, I, there, are, there are features of the fourth view that I now lean toward. I, I think I've been convinced uh, what Longman has to say about the structure of the book. But most of all, I probably like this view the most. And we've called it here, this is a challenge to the secularist, presented in a role-playing format, where Kohelet, the wisdom teacher, is going to view life, well, let me, let me read a, a couple of quotes here. He's going to view life the way the average person in the world views life. And he's going to intentionally do this for shock effect to cause that person to see, or to cause anyone to see, that this is not going to lead to the meaning in life that we're looking for. Let, let me read just a few things that he says about it. Um, Kohelet is addressing the general public whose view is bounded by the horizons of this world. He meets them on their own ground, and he proceeds to convict them of its inherent vanity, that is, the vanity of this world. His book is in fact a critique of secular, secularism and of secularized religion. Um, he goes on to say, so throughout the book, with the rarest of disclaimers, Kohelet shocks us into seeing life and death strictly from ground level and into reaching the only conclusions from that standpoint that, on, that, that honesty will allow. Um, the difference between two and three is two is claiming that this is actually internally a person wrestling back and forth himself between two views. Number three would say this person, Kohelet, this wisdom teacher, knows exactly what he wants to say, and he's going to creatively present it in a way as if he were, in a role-playing kind of a way, as if he were the average man who is seeing life only from ground level, only under the sun. And we'll next, next week we will get to the, the importance of expressions. Uh, this, this is a very satisfying view of the book in my estimation because wisdom teaching often involved a lot of creativity. And that creativity uh, at times could be the playing of roles and the, the hearer is to be able, we should be able to figure out what he is trying to do here, which I think we can figure out. So it's not, it's not a man who, doesn't, who hasn't found his way. He knows exactly what he wants to say, and he is simply portraying life the way the average person sees it. And then, of course, at the end, the punchline, he's going to be able to show that this is why life is so meaning, meaningless to you, is it was never intended to deliver. This view, number three, lays heavily on the expression life under the sun. And life under the sun would represent life in an earthly dimension without any spiritual input, without any spiritual dimension to it. So that Kohelet here is intentionally role playing and he's intentionally making his case. Now, I'm out of time and so I'm going to come to this one next time. But I, I do find Tremper Longman, who has looked at the structure of the book, has added some really interesting observations as to whether there may be more than one person, uh, person involved in this dialogue in the book. And I'll get to that a bit next time. Um, he sees the book, I think, it's, it's, a very, it's a very fresh look at Kohelet and at the book. And he sees this book in a different way than a lot of others have seen it. And I think uh, there's a lot of merit to it. I, I'm, I'm convinced of some of his structural things. But we will get to that next week. Another thing we're going to get to much more in depth next week is one of the keys to understanding Ecclesiastes is to know a group of about six or eight terms in the book and what they mean. The vocabulary, in other words, that Kohelet is using as he teaches wisdom. And when you know those, when you understand those, I really think that the message of the book is much clearer because you can understand what he meant by certain terms. Um, this would be a book that um, by taking a yellow highlighter and going through it and marking the most often used terms, 
It really is a good technique to understand the meaning of the book. Those, those terms become, those vocabulary terms become the key, I think, to understanding the meaning of, what, of much of what he is saying. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.